Okay, here we're going to cover chapter 46, which is microbiology and disease. And microbiology is actually pretty cool. Um, there's lots of stuff in this chapter, um, and we get a chance to look underneath the microscope and take a look at different microbes um, that cause disease and how we can actually detect what microbes are causing the problem. So lots of fun things to do in this chapter. Um, we are going to cover quite a few learning outcomes. Okay, so this seems kind of long. There's a lot in this chapter. It's fairly long. Um, and so we will talk about what the MA's role would be in microbiology. And then we'll actually kind of talk about the different microorganisms, um, how they cause disease, how we classify them. Um, and then we'll look at those different classifications. We'll look at viruses, bacteria, uh, protozoans, and some of the human parasites that exist. Uh, we'll talk about the process involved in actually diagnosing an infection. Um, we'll talk about some different um, guidelines that are used to obtain specimens. And then we'll talk about transportation of those to outside laboratories. A uh, couple of different kinds of techniques that we actually use for direct examination of culture specimens. Um, and then at the end, the, one of the things that we'll get to do from this chapter is be able to do a gram stain. And so we'll talk about some of the different procedures prepping and carrying out uh, a stained specimen. Um, and then how we would actually send culture materials off to the, to the lab. Okay. The other thing at the end that we'll talk about too is um, antimicrobial or antibacterial sensitivity determination as well. Okay. And so when we start here, what we're looking at is microorganisms. And another word for microorganism is microbe. Um, you'll hear that word used as well. And microorganisms are everywhere in the environment. The word that that actually means is ubiquitous. They are everywhere. Um, and most um, microbes and most um, um, microorganisms are not dangerous. They are either beneficial to us or they are completely harmless and just exist with us. Uh, but there are certain things that can cause um, a specific bacteria or organism to become pathogenic in nature. And some are pathogenic in nature um, just because of what they are. Others can become um, pathogenic by displacing them for their natural environment. And an example of that um, is E. coli. E. coli is part of our normal intestinal flora, our normal bacterial makeup, and normally it's beneficial for us because it, they, that particular bacteria makes vitamin B and especially vitamin K, which actually we use for blood clotting. And so it's an important bacteria for us. Now, what happens is, is that that bacteria can be um, excreted with feces. And so if we have water or food products or food sources that become contaminated, um, by, you know, become contaminated by feces, and then someone ingests it, then that's how E. coli can become a pathogenic bacteria. Normally, it's no problem. Um, but if you disrupt it and move it from its normal environment, it can then become pathogenic. Okay. And so some of the things that medical assistants can do um, within this particular area is identifying specific microorganisms. Um, there's definitely going to be a huge a role as far as proper collection techniques, um, different testing procedures, because we will be doing rapid streps. And so the low complexity tests can be involved in this area. And then quality control is also an important area in this field. Okay. So microbiology is the actual study of these microorganisms. Sometimes it can further specialize into bacteriology or virology, where we actually narrow down the microorganisms and the specific study of those, but the actual generalized study of microorganisms is called microbiology. Um, most microorganisms are not a problem, okay? And we actually have our own specific bacterial makeup um, called our normal flora, and that normal flora is consistent on our skin, it is in our the vaginal area, and it's also within the, in the intestines. And so we have normal good bacteria that are there and actually maintain the environment so that other pathogenic um, bacteria can't invade, um, or even funguses. There's a number of, we always, most people have small amounts of fungus or fungi on the skin, and our normal resident um, bacterial flora actually prevents those uh, fungus from causing infection. Okay.
And so most of the time, microorganisms are good, but obviously there are some that are pathogenic in nature, and then certain circumstances where normal ones can actually become pathogenic from disrupting their, their normal environment, okay? And so there may be cases of times where you guys will just be assisting a clinician in the role of microbiology. Other times you may be preparing the specimens. And so it'd be important to know what your role is depending on what kind of facility you're in. Okay, so oops. what role does a medical assistant play in relation to microbiology? You may be able to assist in obtaining specimens. Um, you might be able to obtain the specimens yourself, prepare them for direct examination. Um, or properly prepare them to be transported to a reference laboratory. And there may be some things in the microbi uh, microbiologic procedures that you're able to do. Generally, they would be involved with a low complexity um, arena. Um, some of these tests that we'll talk about and deal with in, in this section will also be moderate. And so some of the things that we do here, you may not be able to do on the outside, but having a working knowledge much more understanding as you're going through, okay? Okay. All right, so how do microorganisms cause disease? Okay, um, there are as many microbes as there are, most of them don't cause infection. However, there are still a variety of pathogens that do cause disease. And so um, we do have our, if you remember from anatomy and physiology, our immune system, we do have a number of ways that our body works to. Um, avoid getting infection. And so our skin, the bacteria, our normal flora on the skin maintain an environment that's not suitable for pathogens. Um, we have mast cells and a number of cells in our mucous membranes. There's a number of ways that our body can prevent um, pathogenic organisms from getting inside, but there are still times where we might inhale something or we have the integrity of the skin is broken by a cut or a area of irritation, and that can allow um, some form of back, some form of infection to set in. Okay, um, and there are a number of ways that um, these microbes can actually cause disease. There's once again, you can get you can break through the barrier of the skin. It can um, be ingested. It can be inhaled. So there's a number of different ways that pathogens can cause infection. Um, sometimes things remain local, um, like a local infection. Um, you break the skin, bacteria sets in, it stays localized. The problem with localized infections is that if it's not taken care of, it can become systemic. And systemic means that it's actually affecting the entire body. If it penetrates into the blood system, uh, that bacteria or that infection can get into the blood and then it can become a systemic infection. Okay. And then there's times where we can transmit something directly or indirectly. Directly would be directly inhaling um, particles from a cough that encapsulates a virus or bacteria, and then you inhale it. Um, indirectly would be like if you cough into your hand and touch a doorknob, um, and then someone comes along and touches the doorknob and then touches their face. That's sort of an indirect way. And then when we use um, things like vectors, like mosquitoes and ticks can actually transmit bacteria via a bite. So that's considered an indirect or or utilizing a vector, okay? And so when we actually go through, we can classify and name microorganisms, um, first of all, according to their structure, okay? And so when we look at these structures, they're divided into three categories. And so our first category is something called the subcellular category. So sub means under, cell is referring to a cell. And so these structures tend to be smaller than a normal cell. They're very simple. Um, an example of this is a virus. And so viruses tend to be some form of genetic material, either RNA or DNA, that are encapsulated in a protein. And viruses generally can't exist on their own. They have to live within, uh, they have to get inside a cell and take over the cell's structure and then cause that cell to, to burst. And then that allows the, the virus to replicate. Okay. Um, another similar. Um, subcellular particle is called a prion. And they don't talk about it much in the book, but a prion is just sort of a um, small piece of protein. And that small piece of protein can get into a cell's DNA and take over the cell as well. And so prions are actually smaller than um, 
than the classic virus. Um, and um, a couple of disease processes that um, are from a prion are Jacob Kreuzfeldt disease as well as um, mad cow disease. And the brain seems to be the organ that is susceptible to those types of prions, okay? The other thing about subcellular organisms is we can't use our normal compound microscope to see them. Um, and with our compound microscopes, we our maximum um, our maximum amplification is a thousand times. And so um, the viruses and prions are so small that those microscopes can't be used um, to see them. We have to actually use something called an electron microscope um, or some other high intensity amplification. Um, instrument that allows us to see those. So we wouldn't be able to see viruses or prions with our prototypic compound microscope, okay? Then we move up the ladder and go to a prokaryote. And a prokaryotic um, um, organism is something that is a, is a very simplistic cell. It's the most simplest cell that there is, okay? And bacteria fall under these, this particular category. Um, Prokaryot, uh, the prokaryotic cells tend to um, be very simple. They don't have a nucleus or any specific organelles, but they usually do have a pretty elaborate cell wall. And so we'll kind of talk about some of the different cell walls with the bacteria, and that's kind of how they're, the way they replicate and how they form colonies tend to be um, how you can classify them, okay? And then lastly, we have eukaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells are more complex um, cells. They have a nucleus, they have organelles, and that, those categories include protozoans, fungus, and certain parasites. Now, our human cells are also eukaryotic, um, but we're not going to be dealing with human cells in this particular in this particular area because we're talking about microorganisms. Okay. And so there's also a naming process that we use to name these organisms. Um, and so the two names that they have, it's basically like having a first and a last name. Um, they have a genus, which is their first name, which is considered their biologic classification. And then they have a species name, which is basically the species of that organism, which is distinct type of microorganism within that genus, okay? And so, when we look at the the naming process, um, the first word the first word that's listed is called the genus, and that usually is capitalized. Okay, and this is the category of biologic classification. And an example that you might have heard of is Staphylococcus. Okay, Streptococcus is alt is also another type of genus. Um, and so when we look at this, we're getting two a little bit we're getting two pieces of information from the word Staphylococcus. Okay, Coccus is referring to its shape, which is circular, but staph is actually um, referring to the configuration underneath the microscope or how that particular bacteria lives. And staph means cluster. So staphylococcus are usually bacteria that live in a cluster like a grape, like, like a cluster of grapes, okay? As opposed to streptococcus, which exists in chains. Strepto means chain, okay? And then the second name is the species of the organism. And that's sort of a distinct type. It actually differentiates that particular um, type of microorganism. And so some examples of Staphylococcus are Staph aureus and also Staph epidermidis. Now, both of these are very common and they're commonly on the skin. Staph epi is a real common benign um, bacteria that makes up our normal flora on our skin. Now, some people have small amounts of Staph aureus on their skin as well, and some even actually carry it in the respiratory tract. And most of the time, Staph aureus is not a problem. Uh, but there are times where Staph aureus can turn into a pathogenic bacteria because it's been disrupted or something's happened to it that causes it to become pathogenic, okay? All right, so the questions here. How do microorganisms cause disease? Um, organisms cause disease by using some form of nutrient that is needed by the cells and tissue that it's around. Um, or it can also uh, damage the cell directly by getting into that cell, taking over the DNA, and then causing that cell to lyse, and then that's the way that the um, virus can replicate. Um, it can also affect the body's defenses to attack that cell, and then other uh, types of or, uh, microorganisms can actually produce a toxin, which can then be 
uh, detrimental to the surrounding skin and tissues that can cause a problem. So those are the different ways that microorganisms can cause disease. And then as we classified, we showed uh, the three different classifications, subcellular organisms or viruses. Prions are not listed there, but they kind of tend to fall under that category as well. Prokaryotic or are simple cell organisms, the most simplest form, and those are bacteria. And then eukaryotic organisms are larger, more complex, um, which are protozoans, fungi, and parasites. All right, so let's break these classifications down a little bit. So our first uh, subcellular um, microorganism are viruses, and they are the smallest known infectious agents. But once again, prions are also um, kind of included in this area, but they don't really deal with prions too much here. And so viruses are subcellular microorganisms. They have a nucleic acid, which is either RNA or DNA, and they are surrounded by a protein coat, okay? A key thing with viruses is they must live and grow inside a living cell of another organism. They don't exist on their own. Now they can be passed via water droplets um, or exist sometimes for short periods of time on an external surface. Uh, but then they must have a host that picks it up so that they can continue to grow and replicate, okay? And so when we look at medicine, uh, we look at bloodborne pathogens as being one of our more important. There are a bunch of viruses, but we're going to focus a little bit on our bloodborne pathogens. And you probably got some of this um, part of our lecture in infection control because we're going to talk a little bit about HIV and hepatitis because those are the two bloodborne pathogens that we have to kind of pay the most that pay that play the most significant role in healthcare. And so we'll talk a little bit about both of those, how they cause infection, some of the risk factors, um, how the infection progresses, and then different treatments and special precautions regarding them. And so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because you guys should have covered this in infection control, but we will touch on it here. Okay. And so when we look um, at AIDS or the HIV infection, the HIV virus is the human immunodeficiency virus. Um, and remember that this virus actually infects the helper T cells. Okay. And I remember the helper T cells are the cells that kind of play the in between between um, our innate immunity and our adaptive immunity. And so if we don't have that transition, we can't make antibodies, we can't form memory cells. And so when someone has HIV or human in, immunodeficiency uh, syndrome or the virus, then what happens is, is our immune system can't function properly. And so these patients develop a lot of what's called opportunistic infections. Opportunistic is indicating that an infection that our body, if our immune system was normally intact, that our body would normally fight off. But because our immune system or the immune system, a patient with HIV is altered or affected and isn't, isn't capable of producing the same immune response, then that patient's body becomes subject to those types of infections. Okay. So some of the risk factors for HIV infection are unprotected sexual activity. Okay, so these this infection can be passed via blood, can be passed via um, seminal or vaginal secretions. And so anything that allows that exchange, sexual activity and sharing um, needles um, are all possible ways of spreading this infection. Um, there was a time where um, Blood transfusions were causing a small portion of that. Obviously, we test for that now. Um, and there is something called vertical transmission where a mother can pass it to her fetus. And so there is medication that can be taken that decreases that risk. Um, AZT was one of the first HIV medicines that was used or given out for HIV infection. They found that that particular medication can decrease um, the risk of transmission from about 25% down to less than five. And so it is a significant decrease in, in passage or in vertical transmission. And then the risks in the medical community involve exposure that can be percutaneous. Percu per percutaneous indicates through the skin or like a needle stick. Um, mucocutaneous would be something where it um, it passes through a mucous membrane, okay? So that's if blood were to come in contact with an open, open wound or open sore or even into a mucous membrane like the eye, um, that is a possible way to, um, to expose someone to that as well, okay? Which is why 
it's important in certain case scenarios to wear um, a face shield or goggles to protect your eyes, okay? Now, the progression of the infection, there tends to be an initial infection um, where somebody gets a mild flu-like symptom, and then it may go unnoticed for a number of years, okay? The incubation period um, can be um, real variable depending on the person's immune system, okay? And then somewhere along the line, that infection, the virus starts to replicate at a high rate, and then if it hit, and then once that T cell count drops below 200, then that's when that HIV infection that causes that individual to have AIDS acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Okay, and so anything below 200 starts to make that individual or, um, of helper T cells, and sometimes you'll see the helper T cells denoted as CD4 cells. And when those CD4 cells or that CD4 count drops below 200, then that individual is going to be at risk for um, opportunistic infections. So ways that you can diagnose, there are a lot of rapid, there's a lot of rapid tests that can be done. They've actually come up with some at-home tests um that are available because people sometimes are afraid to go into the clinic to even ask for an hiv test to be done so they have gotten to the point where they've um, done um, over-the-counter tests or things that you can buy however anything that were to be positive there would need to be confirmed in a clinic and so an initial test that's done which is an antibody screening test is um, called the elisa test and so that's the initial screening test for hiv but anything that comes back positive would need to be confirmed with the Western blot. And the Western blot is considered the confirmatory test. There are case scenarios where people's or a patient's immune system can be altered or changed or case scenarios where the ELISA test is falsely positive. And so that's why we do have a confirmatory test, okay? Sometimes in patients that have um, immuno, um, autoimmune issues or even patients that are pregnant will sometimes their immune system will react a little differently to those testing and will sometimes have an initially positive test um, that needs to be confirmed by the Western blot, okay? Okay, so we're actually looking at symptoms. That HIV virus can affect almost anywhere in the body. So you can see here listed that there can be systemic infections that are systemic symptoms that include weight loss, fevers, fatigue, um, chills and night sweats. There can be respiratory complaints such as repeated sinus infections, uh, shortness of breath, um, difficulty breathing. There's a lot of oral manifestations that can happen um, such as gingivitis, oral lesions, um, leukoplakia, which is sort of an oral cancer, um, gastrointestinal um, with diarrhea and or bloody stools. Um, the nervous system seems to take a particular toll as well, and so it can affect um, depression, personality changes, concentration, memory loss can accompany this, as well as the peripheral nervous system um, with numbness and tingling of uh, peripheral nerves. There's a number of skin manifestations, dry skin, um, as well as Kaposi sarcoma, which is sort of a rare cancer, um, but it is it was the first um, it was one of the first signs and symptoms that people were finding with patients way back in the 80s that were HIV positive. This was a cancer that a lot of HIV patients that they very rarely see were coming up with. And so prevention um, is to make sure that we're avoiding high risk sexual activity or making sure that we're using um, some sort of barrier protection, um, not using IV, um, sharing IV needles, um, you know, or drug users sharing needles. Um, making sure that within the clinic setting and the hospital setting that we are adhering to strict standard precautions, which means that everyone is treated the same way. We don't assume that one person doesn't have it and the other person does and that we have to treat one person with more precautions than the other. We treat everybody across the board like they have an infectious disease and that way we're not, um, we're being careful not only for the patient safety but for the person or the medical personnel safety, okay? All right, and then making sure people understand the transmission. You can hug somebody that has HIV and not get it, okay? You can have, you can hug them and touch them and you're not necessarily gonna get the infection. So being properly educated on transmission is important as well.
Okay, so obviously early diagnosis with any of these infections is important because the earlier you're diagnosed, the earlier you can start treatment. And we definitely have made huge strides since the 80s um, in treating HIV infection. The combination of different antiviral medications that are available um, have gotten um, so many patients to the point where they don't even shed the virus anymore. So early diagnosis and early treatment is a huge key. Um, and like I said, the drug regimens that are available nowadays, there are some people that have actually almost, they don't like to use the word cure, but their viral load is undetectable. And so they're at the point where they really don't think they can transmit the virus anymore. So that's huge strides since the 80s when we first came in contact with this infection. Okay. And then the other bloodborne pathogen that we have to always think about um, in the medical setting is hepatitis. Now here they're listing um, five different types or, or strains of hepatitis virus. And honestly, there's more like a dozen. We don't list them all here. Every year that goes by, they find another hepatitis strain. The most common ones that we deal with bloodborne in the medical uh, profession are gonna be B and C. Um, a is more of a fecal oral route, and that's sort of a, that's a, um, the form of hepatitis that can come from um, eating at a food establishment where someone had it and then didn't wash their hands properly and then contaminated um, people via fecal oral route with food ingestion. B and C are not via fecal oral route, they are bloodborne. Um, luckily, we do have a vaccine for hepatitis B, it's a three three series vaccine or three shot series vaccine. Um, and it's gonna be the one that most hospitals are gonna to wanna to make sure that you have before you work there. Um, hep C is, um, is definitely a bloodborne pathogen that we have to look at. The unfortunate thing is we don't have a vaccine available for hepatitis C and it can do significant damage to the liver just like hepatitis B can. Um, there are some new medications out that have actually um, gotten to the point where you can almost cure yourself of hepatitis C. So although we don't have a vaccine, um, the new medications that are available um, have shown quite a bit of success in eradicating that particular virus. So risk factors for hep B and hep C are similar to HIV, okay? Pretty much the same, um, not sharing drugs, IV drug use and sharing, sharing those needles. Um, the other thing that will be here is travel. There are certain types of hepatitis that are endemic to certain areas, and some of those are fecal oral as well. Um, so certain travel, which you don't necessarily see with HIV. Um, blood transfusions, which I did mention with HIV, is also a risk, but now they do check whenever you donate blood or do transfusions for hepatitis. Um, and also people that are on hemodialysis, diabetics, and people that are in kidney failure, um, the machines, if they aren't cleaned and dealt with properly, could also transmit hepatitis as well, okay? All right, and so this particular kind of infection um, tends to have what's called a prodromal phase, where you'll, same like HIV, where you can have um, flu-like symptoms of some sort, um, and then it'll go away, and then you'll actually, it'll be gone for a while, and then at some point, um, that virus tends to get into the liver and start to cause a significant amount of liver inflammation. And so when you're at that stage, it's called the icteric or jaundice stage. And that's where there's so much liver inflammation um, that the bilirubin in the system goes up. Now, bili, bilirubin is, goes to the liver to be recycled from old red blood cells and is excreted in the form of bile. But when the liver becomes inflamed, it's, it allows the bile to get loosened in the system and it can cause the skin and the whites of the eyes to turn a very um, high light yellow color, okay? And then there's a convalescent stage where the person gets better. Now, hep A has a little bit of a shorter um, convalescent stage with you know a few months, but hep B, if you actually come in contact with hep B, it can actually take sometimes six months to a year to fully recover. So hep hepatitis, whether it's A, B, or even C, um, can have quite a long uh, recovery phase. Common symptoms are going to be um, nausea and vomiting, decreased appetite, um, fatigue and malaise. Um, there can also be some joint pain. Um, the stomach can feel upset, and that definitely tends to be an act anorexia associated with it, where people have a very low appetite. And then eventually they can get jaundice and or icteric, where the yellows of the eyes of the, the whites of the eyes become yellow. 
And so you have to look at risk factors, obviously exposure incidents if we're dealing with the medical profession. There are a number of blood tests that can determine um, antibody antigen blood tests that can tell where you're at in the phase of the infection. They can do direct testing for the virus as well as checking the inflammation of the liver. Okay. And so preventative measures, very similar um, to HIV, especially when we're dealing with um, hep B and hep C. We have to avoid any contact with any kind of contaminated sub, uh, substances. Um, luckily, we do have a vaccination for hepatitis B. We do not have one for hep C. Uh, but once again, the, the medications that have been um, found to actually um, take care of or use to treat hep C have had a pretty good um, eradication rate. Uh, for hep B, there is something called the HBIG that is a... Um, an immunoglobulin, so it's a post-exposure vaccination that you get from, from that are antibodies that another person that's had the infection creates. Um, and that way you get some temporary um, boost in your immune system, try to prevent that infection from, from taking hold. I'm gonna go through this. Okay, so that was kind of our little talk on, there's a lot more viruses in the book, but that's our talk about bloodborne pathogens. If you look at page 979, um, that goes through, there are some um, tables in this chapter, chapter 46, that kind of isolate out important viruses, bacteria, and what have you. And so the page that talks about other viral infections um, besides HIV and hepatitis is 979. And so going through those tables, you don't have to memorize the tables, but going through and at least looking at the disease process, the causative organ, um, how it gets into the system, and then just some common signs and symptoms will be important. And once again, you don't have to memorize it, but if, you know, given um, two or three diseases, you would need to know whether or not that's, they're viruses or bacteria or protozoans or what have you. So having a generalized um, knowledge, not, not a memorization, but just a little bit of an understanding of the tables in this chapter will be important, okay? So as we move on up the hill, we now have... Um, or to the more uh, sophisticated or larger organisms, the next step is the bacteria. So remember bacteria are the most simplistic cell that we have and they are prokaryotic organisms. Um, some of the classifications is, the one thing is because it's very simple um, and single celled, it can actually reproduce pretty rapidly. So can viruses, but viruses have to overtake another cell, do something to that the DNA of that cell and then lyse it and then reproduce it. Bacteria in and of themselves reproduce by something called binary fission, and it's a pretty rapid um, process. And so bacteria, once they set into an environment where they can grow, they reproduce pretty quickly. Okay, And it's important to go through and be able to classify bacteria. And so the most common classification process that we use is by their shape. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So shape is the most common, but there are other things that we can do to help classify these bacteria. Some of them retain stains. The, the one characteristic with bacteria is although they don't have genetic material or any organelles, they do have um, significantly different cell walls. And so the ability of these bacteria to retain certain dyes can also help classify them or further classify them, okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, there's also the ability to grow with or without air. And so those terms are aerobic and anaerobic. And so you, being able to further um, detect whether or not a bacteria is an anaerobic or an aerobic can help to further classify that particular bacteria. And then there's some biochemical reactions. We're going to talk about this too much in this course, but some bacteria grow in the presence of certain culture media. Some can use um, blood as a nutrient, like a blood auger. Others might grow in the presence of sugar or a certain type of sugar. Others might not. And so those are just certain biochemical reactions that can help further classify bacteria. Okay, so let's talk about the shape a little bit because that's the most common way that we classify bacteria. All right, so the four that are listed here are coccus, bacillus, spirillium, or vibrio. And these, each one of these words kind of denotes a specific shape. And so coccus, staphylococcus, streptococcus are spherical or round, okay? Um, bacillus or bacilli are rod-shaped or kind of rectangular-shaped. Spirillium are 
the first three, four letters are spear, and so that indicates that it's spiral shaped. Sometimes spirillium are also called spirochetes, okay, but they are some form of spiral shape. And then vibrio kind of is, it's kind of a rod shape, but it's in a comma, so it's bent. It's sort of a bent rod. And so um, the most common vibrio that we will kind of talk about in this chapter is cholera, okay? All right. Another classification or way that we can classify and identify um, bacteria is their ability to retain certain dyes. What we will get to do in class is a gram stain. And the gram stain is really important because the ability of certain bacteria to um, hold um, a stain, a specific stain called the um, crystal violet or ultra or crystal violet, which is a purplish color stain versus, and some can retain that stain and some don't. And so that will help us to classify um, certain kinds of bacteria. And that particular one's important because we actually utilize the gram stain or the gram positive or gram negative um, uh, status that a, that a bacteria has as to what kind of antibiotics we use to treat it. So gram stain is a very important stain and helps to uh, further classify um, bacteria so that we can actually make a determination of what the appropriate antimicrobial or, you know, anti antibiotic treatment is necessary. Then there's another stain called an acid fast stain, and this particular stain is important in diagnosing tuberculosis. Acid fast is um, a type of stain that is retained by a uh, class of bacteria called mycobacterium. Um, and that particular mycobacterium that's specifically um, important is tuberculosis. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we, as we get into this as well. Okay. And then once again, we have. Um, the ability to grow in the presence or absence of air. If something is aerobic, aero means air, and so that would indicate that it's a bacteria that grows in the presence of oxygen. Anaerobic grows better in the presence of no oxygen. And then the word facultative means both. So are, there are some that can grow in either or, okay? Now these ones listed here, these four are actually special groups of bacteria. Um, I just mentioned the, the acid fast stain. The acid fast stain um, helps to determine the classification of mycobacteria. That's the primary group that it checks for. The two significant mycobacteria that we need to check for are tuberculosis. That's the most common thing that we're that's relevant in our society. Um, there are some places that still have leprosy, and mycobacterium leprosy is also um, is also a bacteria that it can check for. But pri primarily, we use it to determine the presence of um, tuberculosis, okay? And the mycobacterium have a very, very, th very, very thick waxy cell wall. And so this particular bacterial strain will uptake and have a positive acid fast stain. And the, the significance with that really thick waxy wall um, is characteristic of the fact that it takes um, multiple um, antibiotics in order to penetrate that waxy cell wall. And so when someone has tuberculosis, active tuberculosis, they generally have to take four to five antibiotics for a full year in order to get rid of it. That's how significant that thick waxy wall is. Okay. Then we have two specific um, special groups um, called rickettsiae and chlamydiae. And these two um, forms are kind of, their, their cell walls are a little bit different. And these are both considered intracellular parasites. Even though they are bacteria, they must live inside another um, cell in the case of chlamydia or another organism in the case of rickettsia. And so generally the rickettsia will exist inside a tick or a mosquito where they actually pass the disease process through a bite. And so Rocky Mountain spotted fever and typhus are examples of that. Chlamydia is actually responsible for um, a number of, uh, is, is most commonly a sexually transmitted infection, but it's also common for um, a type of pneumonia um, as well as a conjunctivitis that can lead to, um, that can lead to trachoma, which is uh, one of the leading causes of blindness worldwide, not nationwide, but worldwide, okay? And once again, chlamydia cell wall is kind of odd and differently shaped, and so they are considered intracellular parasites. Then we have a class called mycoplasma. 
And the mycoplasmas are kind of odd because we can't really test for them, but they are responsible for a, a couple of um, STD, STIs that we can't really actually test for, but they're similar to the symptoms of chlamydia. And it's also for it's also responsible for a community acquired um, pneumonia, um, kind of the term walking pneumonia. It's usually a mycoplasma that causes that, and it tends to be the most common pneumonia type in the 18 to 35 range. Okay. So the other factor that we need to look at when we're dealing with um, with uh, bacteria is the fact of drug resistance, and because the bacteria is replicate really quickly and because their cell walls all differ. Um, once a bacteria has been exposed to a specific kind of antibiotic, it can make changes to its cell wall so that the next time it sees it, it isn't resistant to it or it isn't sensitive to it. And so that's um, what has happened in our society now because of the overuse and the inappropriate use of antibiotics has led to some superbugs, okay? Uh, the first two are probably the most common superbugs that we see. People have heard of MRSA, and that's a methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, and that's where our one of our Staph aureus strains have actually become resistant to penicillin and a number of other um, types of antibiotics. And sometimes MRSA can be mild, but other times certain strains of it can be very virulent, and it can almost eat away at tissue. And so that particular... Um, that particular bacteria has now become a superbug and um, has to be carefully watched for and carefully prevented in both the clinic and the hospital setting. Um, VRE is vancomycin resistant enterococcus, and so that has also become a very big, um, a very big uh, resistant um, bacteria in the hospital setting. And so, being careful of those two. Uh, of those two particular strains is very important. And then the other one on this list that's important too is the bottom one, PRSP. That's penicillin resistant um, strep pneumonia. And so that's one that's actually more common in the clinical setting, um, primarily in pediatrics with the overuse of amoxicillin or penicillins to treat things like colds that, that shouldn't be used and, and uh, ear infections, okay. All right, and I know you guys talked about um, drug resistance and MRSA and infection control, so this is kind of a revamp, but once again, it is the overuse of those antibiotics um, and the fact that these bacteria have um, cell walls that vary, but those cell walls can change rapidly and become resistant to these medications. People that have higher risk factors for that drug resistance are the elderly. Um, Certain invasive procedures um, make someone uh, prone to drug resistance. Um, certain underlying conditions and the severity of the illness um, will pose risk factors. Um, another big thing is prior use of antimicrobials and overuse of antimicrobials. That antimicrobial is just an antibiotic. And so making sure that we don't overuse them or use them inappropriately, okay? And then obviously, because these bacteria exist in the healthcare you know, environment, when you're constantly in the hospital or constantly in the clinic, the more you're there, the higher the risk are because that's generally where those bacteria are present. So in order to prevent this antibiotic resistance, um, the first two things that you can do is number one, prevent the, the obtaining that infection as well as prevent transmission. So those are the first things that we have to focus on is preventing the obtaining it and preventing the transmission of it, okay? With that said, we also have to make sure that once we've made a decision to treat an infection that needs to be treated, we have to, number one, know what we're dealing with and make sure that we treat it appropriately, which is why the latter half of this lecture will talk about um, checking for resistance versus sensitivity of certain antibiotics, and we do that in a number of different ways, okay? And then obviously the careful use of antibiotics, only using antibiotics when necessary and trying to avoid what we call shotgunning or just treating antibiotics because people feel like they need something. Um, we really wanna make sure that we only use antibiotics for specific bacterial infections. Viruses, colds are not gonna be of benefit with antibiotics. And so educating not only the healthcare profession, but also the patients that if someone says, you know, this looks viral, we don't need antibiotics for it, 
making sure that patients understand that um, and be willing to hold out and let their immune system take care of that virus rather than going in expecting after two or three days to get an antibiotic because we don't want to use antibiotics for infections that are not from a bacteria. Treating a cold with antibiotics is not appropriate, okay? The other thing that falls in here that's not listed is if you are treated with antibiotics, making sure that you actually take the full course of antibiotics. A lot of times medicine is prescribed for seven to 10 days. And there's a reason for that because you want to make sure if you've got a bacterial infection that you completely treat and eradicate it. If you take things for two, three, four days or take it inconsistently, then it's going to increase the chance of that bacteria um, coming back with a vengeance. And then when it comes back, it's going to be resistant to the medication because it's been exposed to it. It's changed its cell wall. Now suddenly it's resistant and then the infection is now going to pick up and start over again. So making sure that patients take the full regimen, even if they feel better after a couple of days is really important. Okay. All right, so quick question, how are bacteria classified and identified? They are classified most commonly by their shape, but also by their ability to retain certain dyes, gram stain and acid fast stain, their ability to grow in the presence or absence of air, and then certain biochemical reactions, okay? All right, so that was our prokaryotic area. Now we're gonna jump to the protozoa or to the eukaryotic, okay? And so we have three different, um, microorganisms that fall into that category. So protozoans are eukaryotic, but they are single-celled, okay? They're generally found in contaminated uh, soil and water, okay? Um, protozoans are actually the leading cause of death in developing countries, and um, it is important uh, that the infection that we're kind of talking about here is primarily amoebiasis, okay, responsible for amoebic dysentery. Um, that particular infection is, is ingested because the soil and or that's, that's growing food or the water that it's watered with or the water that you're drinking is, um, is contaminated. And then it is, it is ingested via the fecal oral route. And then that person uh, or the people that, um, become infected with this particular protozoan, basically end up having somewhere along the lines of 25 to 30 fecal evacuations a day, and they usually wind up um, dying from dehydration, okay? And they have very severe um, abdominal cramping, bloody diarrhea, and so you can die from that, okay? All right, page 985 talks about a few of the other protozoal infections, um, 985 and 986. The other one that's kind of in that category that we see a little bit more often here is giardiasis. Um, it doesn't happen very often, but it can be. It's a it's a paras or a protozoan that's ingested via fecal oral route and can be um, can definitely be a problematic um, protozoan. Um, it can be found or obtained by drinking uh, like stream water. So that's why it's really important if you're out, out in the woods that you boil your water rather than just drinking from a stream because a lot of stream water and river water is contaminated with, with that particular protozoan. Okay, next in line are fungi. Okay, fungus is singular, fungi is plural. And so fungi are eukaryotic organisms. They also have a very um, a very rigid cell wall. And fungi are divided into two areas. We have single-celled fungus that are called yeasts, and they reproduce by something called budding, where part of their part of their um, part of the organism kind of breaks off and then buds off and then forms another yeast. This picture is kind of superimposed, but you can see a small little bud. Um, the orange one right there is an example of it, and then you can see a little piece is kind of budding off. Um, and then we have um, Multi-celled um, fungus are called molds, and that's kind of what you see if you let like a block of cheese grow for too long or even shredded cheese, uh, mold can start to form on there, and they reproduce by something called spores, okay? Um, the book talks about them a little bit, and so primarily fungus, um, most of the fungus that we are, are used to dealing with are more skin manifestations. Um, athlete's foot, ringworm, um, cradle cap, all of those can be sort of um, 
jock itch, those are all fungus oriented and usually it comes from the skin, something causing the skin to get moist and rub together and then it, it breaks down that normal flora integrity of the bacteria that are normally there and then it'll allow little bits of yeast to grow. And so that's most commonly where we see fungus. Uh, but there are some pathogenic fungus um, as well that are listed on table 46.6. And most of the time we don't have an issue with those pathogenic fungus. Um, our immune system usually keeps everything intact and so we can be exposed to it, but our immune system kicks it out before we ever become symptomatic. But then once again, we talked about HIV patients. Um, fungus are oftentimes opportunistic infections. Probably the most common opportunistic infection is pneumocystis pneumonia, PCP. Um, and so that um, is a type of fungal infection that normally our body um, fights off, but when your immune system is compromised, it can allow those pathogenic fungus um, to take over and cause opportunistic infections. The one that you might see or hear of is on, is on page 988, um, table 46.6. If you look at those, the area third way down, it says candiasis, um, and it has oropharyngeal, it says thrush underneath it, and then vaginal. Those are two opportunistic fungus that can, um, that you will see more commonly um, and don't necessarily have to be truly completely immune compromised to see those. Um, people that have diabetes are prone to both of those infections because they have high sugar levels and that actually promotes the growth of the fungus on the skin or in the mouth. Um, if someone takes oral antibiotics to treat a bacterial infection, that can actually kill off all the good normal flora in the vaginal area and lead to a yeast vaginitis. Um, and even um, sometimes when infants are during the birthing process, if a, if a mother has a little bit of yeast in the vaginal area and then the baby passes through the vaginal canal, um, that baby um, a few weeks to a month after birth can sometimes wind up with something called thrush. And so that's like thick white patches in the mouth. And we do have antifungal um, solutions that can take care of it, but it is it's something that we will sometimes see. Um, and actually people that are asthmatic and use um, steroid inhalers to control their asthma, um, the reason why they advise to rinse their mouth, to have a patient rinse their mouth out after using those um, is because that can increase the risk of getting thrush as well, okay? All right, so our next category are multicellular parasites. And so these are organisms that either live on or inside of another organism. And so those parasites um, use that host for nourishment. And generally it is detrimental to the host, not a good thing, as opposed to a symbiotic relationship where both, both parties benefit. In this particular case, the parasite tends to be detrimental to the host. And we do have another number of parasitic worms that can cause that tapeworms, hookworms. Um, and then there are parasitic insects as well. Um, that can actually bite, like ticks and lice and mites can actually carry things like rickettsia, bite um, an individual and pass that bacteria that way. Um, and then we also have um, some parasitic insects like um, scabies that can burrow underneath the skin and cause an, in an infection or an infestation, okay? Some people tend to get the EBGBs around this particular um, subject. I know page on 988 shows some pictures, um, and I know that can make people feel a little bit uncomfortable here. Okay. All right, so if we go through this quiz, yeast or mold is a fungus. Tapeworm or lice uh, would be an example of a multicellular parasite. Okay. I think this goes out of order here. Um, single celled, much larger than bacteria. Um, would be a protozoan. Okay, then we go to the next one, poor sanitation promotes the spread. Now, normally this is protozoan, um, and the answer would be B, because we talked about how the, um, how the protozoans are responsible for one of the more, uh, the highest um, responsible death rate for, for underdeveloped countries. Uh, but some multicellular parasites would fall into that category as far as poor sanitation as well. Okay. What group reproduces by budding or spores? That would be fungus. And then found in soil and water would be the protozoans, okay? All right, so how do we diagnose infections? Okay, so the first thing that we have to do is get a good history, okay? Um, which is where the, 
the history of present illness and being able to kind of identify all the signs and symptoms that that patient is having is really important, okay? Then we do a physical exam and we take a look at the patient, um, whether we're dealing with a respiratory infection or a skin infection, we have to take a look and get a physical exam and figure out what we're dealing with. From that point, we may need more tests. We might need a culture, we might need blood tests, we might need x-rays in order to help additional tests, okay, in order to start to narrow things down and get a presumptive diagnosis. Then we have to possibly obtain a specimen, and it depends. Not We may not need specimens every time, but certain things we might need to obtain the appropriate specimen, and then we will need to examine that specimen off at times um, to see what we're dealing with. Okay, examples of specimens that we can examine would be some sort of a smear um, and or a wet mount. And we'll talk about what a wet mount is in just a little bit. So at that point, um, we might have to culture. Okay, and we'll talk about a couple of things that fall under that the number three would even be like a rapid strep culture. Okay, we actually can do something um, in in the office. And then that gives us, that's one of our low complexity tests that can give us a preliminary positive or negative. Um, if, we get a pro, if we get a negative test from one of those preliminary tests, then we usually need to take it a step further and send it for culture. And that's where we actually place that, whatever that specimen is, on a Petri dish that has um, a growth medium or auger um, in order to, to give it some nutrients and then put it in a in an incubated situation where we're at body temperature for two to three days. Usually they'll incubate things for anywhere from 24 to 72 hours. And what that allows us to do is put it in an environment where if there is a bacteria there, it can grow and thrive. And then we can actually identify that microorganism by how it looks and some of the other things that we've talked about. And then there's ways we can do antibiotic sensitivity testing. And so there's little antibiotic disks that can be placed. Um, on a plated auger where we put the bacteria, we can actually tell whether or not that bacteria is sensitive or resistant to a particular antibiotic. And then we have to treat the patient appropriately. So this is sort of a series of things that we have to do in order to identify and treat um, infections appropriately. Okay, so what is our process for diagnosing an infection? We have to examine the patient, obtain the appropriate specimen, possibly not always examining the specimen directly we might go straight from two to four and then just culture the specimen that culture will then help determine the sensitivity of certain antibiotics and then we treat appropriately okay all right so when we're looking at collections of the specimen this is where um collection processes are are important because if it isn't collected appropriately or if something is contaminated, it can then cause the results to be altered, okay? And so we always wanna make sure that we use our appropriate container for the specimen and that the swabs that we use are sterile. There are some swabs in the clinic that are not sterile and you can use those for certain purposes, but not when we're doing something that's cultured because culture requires that we have completely sterile situations, okay? And then the collection of the transport system will vary depending on what kind of bacteria we're looking for. So the medium will vary, okay? Okay, and so guidelines for specimen collection are to number one, make sure that we always avoid causing harm. We don't ever wanna do more harm than good, okay? We have to make sure that we collect an adequate amount of sample from the appropriate site. And we always need to make sure that we date and time any anything that we've collected, and we always specify where that's from. If we have a wound culture, we want to say it's a wound culture from a toe, wound culture from an arm, right arm, right forearm. Be very specific about what you about where it is, because that's important. We want to make sure that we have the appropriate device, and that just means that we have the appropriate container or appropriate specimen collection. Um, device so that we are putting the we're using the right um, device to collect what we need. If we use a different device, it won't work, okay? Um, it's also important to make sure that we don't do a culture after someone's already started antibiotics. And this is a thing that we deal with a lot clinically. Someone will 
think they have a bladder infection or a urinary tract infection, they'll have some leftover medication from a sinus infection um, from before and then take two or three days worth of that and then things get worse and then they come into the clinic and go, well, I, you know, I was, I had symptoms for a week and so I took some of this antibiotic for my, from my other, you know, infection that was left over and then now I'm feeling worse. And so the problem with that is, is that then we've already sensitized that bacteria to an antibiotic that may have been inappropriate, but now they may be resistant to it. And so primarily, primarily you wanna make sure that um, you haven't had the person taking any antibiotics, okay? Because that way it can alter um, the results that you get, okay? Um, I'll show you, we'll talk about labeling things um, at your time. Um, and then there's always gonna be a requisition form that has to go along with whatever you're sending out, okay? And a lot of times you have to make sure that you include all of the important information on the patient, the doctor, the area where the specimen was taken from, um, and also a diagnostic code. And you'll get some diagnostic coding experience next semester, but every requisition form, whether it's blood work, urine, or a wound culture is gonna have to have some sort of presumptive diagnosis. And sometimes, um, it's on the medical assistant to look at what the diagnosis is and find the appropriate code and make sure that that code is listed on the requisition form. Many insurance companies won't do the test um, if there isn't a diagnostic code associated with it. Okay, so some of the things that you can collect specimens on are throat culture specimens, and that's what we'll be doing in class. We'll be doing rapid streps. Um, you can also do urine specimens, checking for a urinary tract in um, infection, sputum specimens, checking for certain respiratory illnesses, wound specimens can be done, checking for um, skin type of cellulitis or infections in that way. Um, two things that are not listed here are you can do specimens from the cervix and or vaginal area and check for like sexually transmitted infections. Um, and stool can also have specimens done checking for things like Shigella, Salmonella, and certain parasites. Okay, so when we're doing transportation to an outside laboratory, and if anybody's um, walked by some of the smaller um, doctor's offices, oftentimes you'll see like a metal box hanging off the outside of the door. And so that's actually a collection box. And so if that particular place doesn't do a lot of labs or just needs to have some sort of transport, um, those are often the specimens are placed inside that box. And it's really important to know when your drop off time is. Um, oftentimes they'll have two pickup times where they come in the mid afternoon and then again at the end. Um, but making sure that everything is uh, placed correctly in the appropriate bags labeled requisition form and then placed in those um, transport boxes so that labs can come pick them up and go run um, run those lab um, tests that need to be done on all the specimens and then be able to report things within a day or two, okay? So it's very important to follow proper collection procedures. Um, make sure you prevent deterioration of the specimen and as you go through, you'll learn what needs to be done with certain specimens. Um, you need to make sure that anything that has a lid on it is tightened completely because you don't want urine or fecal contaminant to get inside of a inside of a plastic bag and you want to make sure that you prevent your requisition form from getting contaminated so all three of those collection procedures are important are important um, once again the trend usually labs will pick things up midday and then at the end of the day there's usually reg regularly scheduled pickups depending on what needs to be transported some things need to be picked up stat ASAP um, and then there are some things believe it or not that you can send through the mail and so if something that is a um, biologic um, situation oftentimes stool samples are sent through the mail believe it or not it has to be labeled with something called etiologic agent. And that just lets the mail carriers know um, that what they're dealing with is some sort of biologic agent within that packaging. All right, and so what are general guidelines for specific um, specimen, specimen collection? Um, we want to avoid harm, um, discomfort and undue embarrassment. We want to collect from the appropriate site, make sure that we obtain the specimen at the right time and the correct amount. Um, we always want to try to get that specimen if possible before antimicrobial therapy has been started. 
and then label the specimen correctly. And we'll talk about labeling techniques um, as we go forth through things. Um, and so what are some of the objectives for transporting a specimen to an outside laboratory? Um, we have to make sure we follow proper collection procedures, use the proper collection device, uh, prevent deterioration of that specimen during transport to make sure that we're protecting anybody that may handle that specimen from some sort of exposure. All right, and so there's like we talked earlier about something called a wet mount where there may be um, a time, there's certain things that a physician can actually look at um, in the clinic. And so there are some specimens that you can actually look at so that you can diagnose things immediately. And there is something called a wet mount. Now wet mounts are more, than, most of the time are used within the gynecologic setting where you can actually um, take a look at vaginal secretions underneath the microscope and you can make some determinations. There's um, a vaginal infection called bacterial vaginosis that can be diagnosed with a wet mount. And basically what you do is you take a little bit of vaginal secretions, put some normal saline, put a cover slide, and then take a look at it underneath the microscope. Okay, you can actually do this um, with sperm to determine a motility count. You can also diagnose um, something called trichomonas um, vaginitis, which is a uh, sexually transmitted infection. You can actually see the movement. Um, it's a protozoan. You can actually see the movement of that bacteria, that protozoan underneath a microscope when you do this. And I've seen that quite a bit in my career. Um, when you take that smear, or that specimen, you can also put something called potassium hydroxide. And that's here. That's what the KOH mount is. KOH stands for potassium hydroxide. And what the potassium hydroxide will do is it actually allows um, someone to see a fungal infection more clearly underneath the microscope. And so the potassium hydroxide actually dissolves the keratin um, within the skin cells or the epithelial cells. And so it will elucidate and bring out the fungal infections like a yeast vaginitis um, more clearly. Sometimes dermatologists will also use the potassium hydroxide mount. Um, they can take, if someone's got a dermatitis or skin irritation and they don't know whether it's inflammatory or, um, or fungal, they can take some of the skin, take a scraping of it and put it on a slide and then put potassium hydroxide on it and then take a look underneath the microscope and see if there's a fungal element to it. Um, the problem with that is, is that a lot of times the skin is so much um, thicker and firmer from the skin as opposed to being from vaginal secretions that even that potassium hydroxide can't completely dissolve the keratin in those in those cells. And so even if a dermatologist suspects um, a yeast, some sort of yeast involvement, and if they don't recover it underneath the microscope, sometimes they'll still treat, but sometimes dermatologists will do that to, in order to try to help them make a further diagnosis. So these are tests that can actually be done as far as direct exam of the specimens without having to send to an outside lab. All right, so some of the things that we'll talk about, we will talk about how to prepare a smear on a glass slide. So that's part of what we'll be doing. And then we'll also be doing the gram stain. Now, gram, the gram stain is a moderate complexity test. So it's not something that's done in the normal routine POL or what you guys will probably be doing in a, in a clinic setting, but understanding the concept of it, and we will go through and do it, kind of gives you an idea of what these bacteria look like underneath the microscope. And so it is a series of staining and washing steps. Um, in the middle of it, there is a um, chemical used called iodine, and the iodine acts as a mordant, and that mordant actually allows the bacteria to absorb the stain if they have that capability. And then when you do the gram stain, if it, um, if it retains the purplish color from the, from the crystal violet, then it is considered gram positive. Um, and there are a number of, of bacteria that are gram positive. Then there's other bacteria that are gram negative. And so some of the cell walls cannot hold that crystal violet dye or stain, and it will rinse out and they will be a pinkish color. So this is what we will go through and do in class. Okay, and once again, a lot of our antibiotics are determined and based upon whether or not a bacteria is gram positive or gram negative, and that's how we choose to treat um, certain individuals with certain infections according to that knowledge. All right, what are the methods for preparing a slide for direct examination? 
two types are a wet mount and KOH. Once again, we see this mostly in the gynecologic obstetric setting, um, but you can see it in other sites possibly like dermatology. Okay. And how does the examination of stained specimens facilitate patient care? It helps us to provide a quick tentative diagnosis and then differentiate between types of infections. Now, once we have um, obtained a specimen, then there, the next step would be to attempt to grow that particular bacteria uh, in an environment that allows it to grow. And so if we take a potential, whether it's urine or, um, or maybe a wound infection, we actually, actually have to put it on a culture medium. Okay, and what the medium provides is nutrients so that that bacteria can grow and thrive. So if you do a culture and put it on a plate, and this is called a Petri plate, and it has a blood auger because it's got a red color, which means there's blood within that, that auger that allows certain bacteria to grow in that with that and uses that nutrient to grow. And then we have to put that particular um, culture into an incubator, which is generally at about um, our normal body temperature, 98.6. Okay. And then when you have bacteria in an area, when you put it, when you give it nutrients and put it in a warm place to grow, then that bacteria will multiply. And when that, ba micro, when that bacteria or microorganism multiplies, it can form something called a colony. And that's just a large group of bacteria in a small, in a small area. And you can identify certain bacteria by what their colony looks like, how many, what the numbers are, and any kind of uh, sensitivity or lack of sensitivity to antibiotics from that point. All right, so the culture media that we use um, can be a liquid, it could be semi-solid, or it could even be a solid. And when it's solid, it's called auger. And some of these augers can be selective where they allow certain bacteria to grow and not others. And then other types of auger are non-selective and all can grow on it, okay? And we will be using a blood auger to do um, our uh, bacterial, that'll be our, our medium that we're using for, for our bacteria that we're gonna grow, okay? So I'm gonna talk about different ways to inoculate these, these Petri dishes or these culture plates. And so what can be done in the clinic is gonna be a little bit different than what we do in class because we don't have the capability to heat fix um, or use a Bunsen burner. And so some of these analysis, it's important to know what they are, but we aren't going to be able to do them um, practically in our classroom, okay? And so we'll talk about where, to, where and how to label the plate. Um, we'll talk about some of the different ways to transfer that specimen onto the culture plate. But two different types of analysis that we're actually looking at is something qualitatively versus quantitatively. And so when we do a quantitative or a qualitative analysis, we are actually determining the type of pathogen that is involved. When we do a quantitative, we're looking for the actual number of bacteria present in that sample. And it makes a difference because some infections are treated not only by what type of pathogen, but also the number. So both of these analyses are important. All right, and so we look for the difference between qualitative versus quantitative. You can see how the, um, the way that these are plated are a little bit different, okay? Now we aren't gonna be able to do this in class because we don't have a Bunsen burner to sterilize our, our um, inoculating loop. But these are two ways that you can actually, this is the different type where you're actually qualitatively trying to um, isolate um, what bacteria is causing the infection, which is from the top three. And then the bottom three is actually making sort of what they call a lawn pattern um, where they would put, um, where they would actually plot and put a number of antimicrobial discs down and actually get an idea for the quantitative or the amount of numbers of bacteria, okay? All right, so once again, things that we would look at would be the characteristic of the colonies, the number of the colonies, and then if there's any changes to the media um, around those bacterial colonies, and that can help give us an idea of what bacteria or infection we're dealing with. Now here we have, this is, this is a part where we start talking about antimicrobial sensitivity versus resistance. And so in this particular plate that you see right here, you can see it's labeled Pseudomonas aeruginosa. 
So that's a common, it's a, it's a, it's a bact bacteria that can be actually difficult to get rid of. There's only certain antibiotics that actually take care of Pseudomonas. It can be a tough bacteria to get rid of. Um, but as you can see here, um, they put, see those little white dots? Those are antibacterial discs, and they have a small amount of different kinds of bacteria within it. And so when you see a plate like that, that has an area of clarity around it, that means that the bacteria, you can see the yellow, that's all the growth of the bacteria. But you can see that the way um, that bacteria was growing, it couldn't get near that antibacterial disc. Okay, and so what that indicates is that that bacteria is sensitive to that particular antibiotic because the bacteria could only go to a certain point and then it couldn't go any farther. It couldn't actually grow all the way up to the disc itself. So that shows that there's some, there are some sensitive um, antibiotics to that particular, um, that particular organism, the Pseudomonas. If the growth of the bacteria goes all the way up to next to the antibacterial disc, then that means that there is resistance. That means that that antibiotic doesn't affect that bacteria and it can grow all the way up to it. And so we'll talk about this a little bit more in class, uh, but these discs can give you an idea of whether or not a, a, um, a bacteria is sensitive or resistant. And there is an intermediate stage where where um, that bacteria can go part of the way. They usually measure the distance around, and if it's a great, certain amount of millimeters, it lets us know whether they're sensitive or intermediate. Prototypically, if something is intermediate, we need to treat or change the antibiotic because that means that there's incomplete sensitivity, and that would indicate that um, if it wasn't adequately treated, that the infection could resurge and come back, okay? And we'll go through and, and do a lawn pattern um, of a bacteria or some area and trying to isolate bacteria and then we have some antibiotic discs that we will put on there and you'll get a chance to see how these work a little bit. Okay, and so what is the process? For culturing? Um, we can use selective culture media that allows the growth of only certain kinds of bacteria. Unselective culture media supports the growth of just about all organisms, okay? Um, so if an office received a culture sensitivity report of a bacteria that said it was resistant to a specific antimicrobial, what does this mean? And so if something is resistant, that means that that bacteria cannot be killed by that particular antibiotic um, and that there was an overgrowth. And then in that case scenario, we would have to look for something that bacteria is sensitive to. This is where we get into a big, um, a big issue as far as um, what is sensitive and what is resistant and being careful not to over treat things that don't need antibiotics. And if we get a situation where we have a multi or multi resistant um, bacteria that can make it very difficult to treat. And so that's why being very diligent and making sure that we only treat, we only treat antibiotic infections that are needed and we only treat, um, we don't treat things like viral infections with antibiotics, um, helps to decrease this from occurring, okay? All right, so we're gonna conclude this. Some of the stuff I will re-go over in class and then we'll take it a little bit farther and we'll show some of the minor um, variances that we're gonna use. Some of the stuff in this chapter we can't use. Um, but we'll go through and, and discuss the modifications that we're going to make in order to do these kinds of inoculation plates, grow some bacteria, and then do gram stains on them underneath the microscope. Okay, so I'm checking out, and I will see you guys in class.